On February 4, 2023, U.S. Air Force F-22 Raptors shot down a Chinese surveillance balloon that had transited the U.S. over the previous week. The Raptors call sign was Frank, as in Frank 1 and Frank 2. It was a fitting call sign and a throwback Air Force tribute to a legendary Army Air Service pilot from over 100 years ago, balloon buster Frank Luke, who was the first Army Air Service pilot to win a Medal of Honor for his courageous efforts in downing enemy balloons. In a coincidental twist of fate, these Raptors were from the 27th Fighter Squadron. Turns out, the 27th Aero Squadron in World War I was the last squadron to shoot down an enemy balloon on November 8, 1918. In World War I, while aerial combatants dogfighting over France and Germany have captured the public's imagination, it was the pilots who engaged balloons, called balloon busters, who had a more dangerous mission. You see, balloons serve very important functions during the Great War. In a conflict characterized by trench warfare, balloons were used to observe and detect enemy troop movements, trench systems, and artillery batteries deep into enemy territory. They were used for artillery spotting to direct and correct friendly artillery fires. The idiom we use today, the balloons going up, to indicate when the fight begins, derives from the raising of a balloon signaling the beginning of an artillery barrage, guided by information provided by the balloon's observer. With a radio, but more typically a landline, observers in the balloon would communicate with the friendly ground elements. They provided an early warning capability. Balloons were also used to transport goods, messages, and people across the battlefield. The effectiveness of balloons is written in military accounts. Soldiers and Marines on the front knew that if you could see a German observation balloon, he could see you, and accurate artillery fire would soon follow. The Marines' battle for Bellow Wood in June 1917 provides just one awful example. As the fighting increased, German artillery, assisted by spotters in aircraft and balloons, crashed down upon the Marines' defensive positions. The incoming rounds could be both high explosive and gas. What made the German defenses all more lethal were German observation balloons north of the village of Bello, from which operators could see all that occurred in the fields. The German spotting balloons were so critical that when Marine Corps General Charles C. Krulak researched the events at Bello Wood decades later, every oral history he encountered from Marine veterans mentioned the balloons at the battle. Because of these important balloon functions, pilots of both sides engaged to shoot down balloons. And because of this air threat, balloons were ringed with formidable ground-based air defenses, anti-aircraft weapons, and often pursuit planes in the air whose mission was to intercept enemy aircraft attacking the balloons. So while a typical dogfighting combat pilot would face other enemy pilots, the balloon buster pilots faced daunting, deadly, air defenses. For both sides, then, balloons were high-value targets. Downing balloons could leave enemy formations blind. American ace Eddie Rickenbacker thus noted that on September 26, 1918, the first day of the Meuse-Argonne offensive, headquarters had sent us orders to attack all the enemy observation balloons along that entire front this morning and to continue the attacks until the infantry's operations were completed. Accordingly, every fighting squadron had been assigned certain of these balloons for attack and it was our duty to see that they were destroyed. The safety of thousands of our attacking soldiers depended upon our success in eliminating these all-watching eyes of the enemy. To counter Allied balloons, the German army could shell the balloon company's position and, or, direct anti-aircraft fire at the balloon in the air. But only 12 
of the American Expeditionary Force balloons were destroyed by shell fire. That was the lesser threat. Almost triple that number, 35, were burned during 89 air attacks. World War I American fighter ace Frank Luke Jr. was a daring and brave balloon buster credited with shooting down 14 German observation balloons and several German aircraft, a total of 19 victories, all in a scant 17 days. Luke Air Force Base in Arizona is named after him. No one had the sheer contemptuous courage that boy possessed. He was an excellent pilot and probably the best flying marksman on the Western Front. We had any number of expert pilots and there was no shortage of good shots, but the perfect combination, like the perfect specimen of anything in the world, was scarce. Frank Luke was the perfect combination. Now I want to read you an Air Force excerpt of his exploits on the last day of his life. His last flight was on September 29, 1918. At least 13 French in the village of Merval, France, watched his final blaze of glory. That little group later made a sworn statement of his actions that day. They said they saw an American aviator with a squadron of Germans pursuing and shooting at him. He descended suddenly and vertically toward the earth, then straightened it out and flew toward Breyer's farm where he found a German balloon which he shot up and burned in spite of the incessant enemy fire. He destroyed two other balloons while still flying through hostile fire, both from troops on the ground and the German fighters. He did not escape unscathed though. Even though already wounded, he attacked one more observation balloon and the Frenchman saw it burst into flames and plummet to the ground. Luke then descended to within 50 meters of the ground and opened fire on enemy troops, killing six and wounding as many more. But his time was limited. His wounds and the damage to his aircraft forced him to land. As German soldiers surrounded him on all sides, he drew his 45 caliber pistol and defended himself until he fell, mortally wounded by a bullet in his chest. He was buried in the village and his grave was later relocated to the Meuse Argonne American Cemetery. The British, French, Germans, Australians, and Canadians had developed balloon warfare strategy and tactics by the time the U.S. entered the war in mid-1917. The Brits and French called the balloons sausages. The Germans called them Drachen, meaning dragon, as well as kite. Working with hydrogen gas to inflate the balloons could be dangerous. At Fort Sill, Oklahoma on April 2, 1918, static electricity, likely triggered by improper adherence to electrical grounding procedures, ignited a balloon while the ground crew was still holding onto guide ropes. Six were killed and 30 more were injured. Another accident occurred in Omaha, Nebraska one month later when the explosion of a balloon killed two and injured 26. The accident was attributed to poor gas quality and a static spark. The balloon section of the American Expeditionary Forces in France, part of the Air Service, eventually included 35 balloon companies comprising 446 officers and 6,365 men. Like artillery, the balloon companies were assigned to support and move with divisions, corps, or armies. The balloon observers, a mix of air service, coastal artillery corps, or field artillery officers, ascended above the battlefield to altitudes between 1,000 and 4,000 feet, communicating typically by telephone line to the ground. One or two officers took plotting boards, binoculars, and maps of the trench lines with them on each ascension. Dressed in leather and fur, they faced the winds and weather in open wicker baskets. 
Each wore a harness attached to a static line to a silk parachute packed inside a canvas bag outside the basket. So if they jumped, there was no D-ring to pull. The 170 enlisted men in each balloon company had a variety of tasks. Balloon and vehicle repair, preparing a camouflage balloon bed, inflating the balloon with hydrogen gas, operating the winch mounted on a French ladle truck that spooled the balloon's cable to raise or lower the balloon, operating a chart room and telephone communication center, stringing lines and hauling down the balloon. Each company had drivers and mechanics, parachute riggers, and cooks. Typically, balloons were tethered to a steel cable attached to a winch that reeled the gas bag to its desired height, often above 3,000 feet, and retrieved it at the end of an observation session. Working in pairs, the work of a balloon observer was dangerous, as they stood in a wicker basket for hours at a time. They were in direct contact with headquarters and artillery batteries, so could direct changes in artillery fire, as well as reporting on moves made by the enemy, even miles beyond the enemy line. Unlike pilots, balloon observers had parachutes. But parachutes were no guarantee of safety. On 3 July 1917, Canadian Lieutenant Eric Cleaver parachuted from a balloon which burst at 4,000 feet. But the balloon suction pulled him up and closed his parachute. He fell rapidly with the balloon and was killed. The slightest miscalculations could result in death, and often did. Captain Basil Hallam Radford was a famous British stage actor who served as a balloon observer during the war. On 20 August 1916, he made an ascent with his partner. Unusually, though, a third man, whose brother was a school chum of Hallam's, was invited along as a guest. While at altitude, the balloon broke from its mooring and began drifting towards enemy lines. He gave his parachute to the friend that he had invited, and the other two men parachuted to safety. Somewhere between three and 6,000 feet and with hundreds of witnesses, Hallam chose death over capture and leapt from the balloon. His body was so mangled he could only be identified by his cigarette case. Attacking balloons was called roasting sausages. Many pilots who succeeded in roasting a sausage were shot down in the process. Some were caught in the blast of the burning hydrogen. Technical realities shaped the tactics of enemy pilots. Sending rounds through the balloon envelope did not necessarily down it. Regular bullets would pass through the fabric without more effect than causing some slow leakage. Incendiary bullets might not ignite the gas unless some oxygen had mixed with the hydrogen. The incendiary bullets, moreover, were not hot over their full flight. They had an effective range of 350 yards, after which distance the phosphorus was burned out. An American military hydrogen expert wrote, Many instances were on record in which enemy planes did not open fire on the balloon until they were within 50 meters of the balloon. To incentivize their pilots to attack the well-protected balloons, Germans credited their pilots with one and a half kills for every downed balloon. The most prolific balloon buster was Willie Coppens of Belgium with a score of 34 balloons and 8 aircraft. Here is a painting courtesy of Cranston Fine Arts entitled Balloon Buster Extraordinaire. In this painting entitled Last Kill of the Day, Coppens is shown in Henriot HD1 number 24 destroying a German balloon in the closing minutes of the day near Hathorst, Belgium. Following statistics demonstrate the danger of being a balloon observer. During the war, American observers made 125 parachute jumps, 61 from burning balloons, and 64 from balloons that failed to burn. 35 balloons were burned by enemy aircraft during these attacks, 12 balloons were destroyed by enemy artillery. Many were scrapped after being rendered useless by bullets 
anti-aircraft fire or torn apart in storms. The balloon of the 12th Company broke away and Lieutenants Roland S. Tate and George S. Henman were captured by the Germans on September 12, 1918. On September 26, 1918, Lieutenant Cleo J. Ross was killed while jumping from the burning 8th Balloon Company basket when the flaming mass fell on his descending parachute. He was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross posthumously and Ross Field, California was named in his honor. Lieutenant Harold E. Dungan, 2nd Company, made the most adjustments on the front. I'm not sure what an adjustment is and was recommended for the Distinguished Service Cross and Lieutenant Frank M. Henry, 2nd Company, had the record of 163 hours, 14 minutes in the air on the front. Incredibly, there are statistics on the observers, how many times they jumped and such. There are eight observers who jumped twice in one day because their balloon was burnt or shot up also several observers who had multiple jumps during the war. One by the name of G. Phelps had five jumps. There were several who had four jumps. After the war, with the exception of a few outfits, the balloon companies were phased out. The organizations that were retained were eventually designated as airship companies handling a new type of motorized blimp. A few years later, a number of balloon officers testing the newly acquired Italian semi-rigid dirigible Roma were killed when it crashed near Langley Field, Virginia. Larger and faster aircraft frames would render balloon operations obsolete. The Army's lighter-than-air service was abolished about 1932. If World War I balloon operations are of interest to you, I will email you this journal article on observation balloons in World War I and a second journal article on balloon service in World War I written in the, who knew, National Association of American Balloon Corps Veterans. As always, thank you for watching.